Hello everyone and welcome back to another True Crime Mysteries video. Thank you all for being here. Today we're discussing five cases where the person who served the prison sentence was discovered to have been wrongly accused. Let's get into it. We applaud the advances in forensic technology, helping to find justice for victims after decades. But sometimes, with these new advances, we also discover some of the people serving the time never committed the crime. Their lives and families were ripped apart, disrupted, and sometimes not getting exonerated for decades, only clearing their name after spending most of their life in prison. These are their stories. Number 1. Maurice Hastings It was in 1983 in Inglewood, California, when Roberta Weidermeyer was abducted, murdered, and stuffed into the trunk of her own vehicle. Her cause of death was a single gunshot wound to the skull. Roberta had gone out for a late night trip to the grocery store and was believed to have been attacked in the parking lot. Her husband and a friend had gone out searching for Roberta's car when she didn't return home. And when they found her vehicle, they said that they saw a man fleeing. One of the key attributes in their description was that the man was African American and tall. And several months after Roberta's murder, law enforcement arrested Maurice Hastings, who lived in the area. They picked him up and put him in a lineup with six others. The men picked Maurice from the lineup and he went to trial for the murder of Roberta Weidemeyer. Maurice had always maintained his innocence with the claim that he was just in the wrong place at the wrong time. He also had multiple people able to confirm his alibi, but it didn't help. There had been no forensic evidence connecting him to the crime and his trial exclusively relied on eyewitnesses who believed they had seen him driving Roberta's car. His first trial resulted in a hung jury and he went to trial again and this time was convicted. He faced the death penalty, but the jury recommended a life sentence. He was given a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Foreign male DNA was found on Roberta's body but was never tested. Maurice had requested in an appeal in 2000 to have that DNA evidence tested, but a judge denied the appeal, upholding the conviction. In 2022, the Innocent Project took on Maurice's conviction, and with their help, the DNA evidence was located and tested. The DNA was determined not to be Maurice Hastings. It was, however, connected to a man that had been convicted of sexual assault and murder in a manner closely resembling how Roberta Weidermeyer was killed. That man had died in prison in 2020. On October 20th, 2022, the now 69-year-old Maurice Hastings was released with the full exoneration after serving 38 years in federal prison. Upon his release, Hastings said, I prayed for many years that this day would come, and I'm not pointing fingers, I'm not standing up here a bitter man, but I just want to enjoy my life now while I have it. Mr. Hastings maintained his innocence from the time police arrested him throughout two jury trials. And this year, DNA testing proved his innocence and made him once again a free man on October 20th. But for 22 years, Hastings begged for DNA testing to be used in his case, and his requests were denied. And they said, no, we don't have that evidence. We threw that away. We disposed of that, the evidence in my case. So they said that they got rid of it. The District Attorney's Conviction Integrity Unit and the Innocence Project at Cal State LA worked together on Hastings' claim. And it wasn't until this summer that his DNA was submitted, showing his DNA did not match. Thanks to modern science, we now know the identity of another man who we believe was involved in the abduction, sexual assault, and murder of Mrs. Watermeyer. With so many years lost, Hastings says he just wants to move forward and enjoy life starting with the day he was released. It was pretty festive. Uh, me and uh, the team of attorneys, my family, and, and, and we had lobster and, <laughs> and all of that. You know, all of that was good. I haven't had that in, in quite a long time, you know? So it was wonderful. Number two, Richard Knapp. It was in April 2019 when Washington State Police made an announcement hailing genetic genealogy for the recent arrest of a suspect believed to be responsible for the 1994 murder of Audrey Oline Frazier. Audrey was 26 years old when her body was discovered in her apartment after a neighbor called for a welfare check. She had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. At the time of the initial investigation, multiple sources of DNA were found in her body as well as in her apartment. 
In 2018, DNA from the case was sent to Parabon Nanolabs and a suspect was identified as Richard Knapp. Knapp had a sexual assault charge in 1986 that he was convicted for, which seemed to be why Knapp was arrested over the other suspects. Knapp maintained his innocence when being interrogated about the crime did not recall knowing Frazier, but did admit that at the time he was known to abuse substances, particularly alcohol, and frequent the same bars that she went to regularly and recalled that at the time it wasn't uncommon for him to go home with women he met at the bar. He was arrested and charged in 2019 and held without bail while further court proceedings went forward. He spent three years in jail and was released on November 30th, 2022, now 63 years old. The courts determined there wasn't enough definitive evidence to connect him to Audrey Fraser's murder and instead are pursuing another suspect. Fraser's neighbor, who had called law enforcement to check on her, was also discovered to have been one of the sources of male DNA. His DNA was found in multiple areas of the crime scene. Police records show that he was interviewed at the time of the initial investigation and even admitted to having sex with the victim the night she was murdered. At this time, this man has not been charged and other details have not been released as to why the Washington courts believe he is more likely a suspect in this murder investigation. Richard Knapp's lawyer made this statement to the media, quote, Richard spent 1,312 days in jail. He lost his name, his job, his life. His wife died in June 2021. She went to sleep knowing they were together, although he was in jail. Richard has maintained his innocence since his arrest, and the decision today speaks for itself. Number 3. Horace Roberts It was on April 13, 1998, when Terry Cheek didn't show up for work. She was reported missing, and four days later, her body was found abandoned on the shore of Corona Lake in Riverside, California. Terry had been strangled to death. The last people to see her alive were her two daughters and her husband, Googie Harris. The two were recently separated with reports from friends and neighbors that Harris had been abusive. Despite that, he wasn't investigated for his wife's murder. Instead, law enforcement honed in on a relationship Terry was having with a co-worker, Horace Roberts. Horace was picked up and interrogated for hours. Initially, he lied about having an extramarital affair with Terry Cheek, he later stated that this was out of shame and embarrassment, but was seen by law enforcement as more than a guilty conscience, believing a man capable of lying about an affair was one capable of lying about murder. The physical evidence in the case was largely circumstantial. An eyewitness claimed to have seen a truck in the area where Terry's body was dumped, which matched Horace's vehicle, but there was nothing else to confirm other than a vague description. Terry's daughter also identified a purse found in Horace's home that she thought might have been something that her mother had worn the night she went missing. And a watch found at the crime scene was believed to have belonged to Horace, but this again, this relied on eyewitnesses who believed Horace wore a similarly styled watch. No physical evidence directly tied Horace to the crime. Horace went through three full trials before a conviction stuck. The first two concluded with a hung jury. On July 16, 1999, he was convicted of murder and sentenced to 15 years to life in prison for the murder of his girlfriend, Terry Cheek. Horace made several appeals to have the evidence in his case re-examined and maintained his innocence. In 2003, the Innocence Project became involved in his case and they were able to determine that the prosecution had withheld evidence during his trial that would have likely led to a not guilty verdict. DNA testing of the watch determined that there was no DNA belonging to Horace Roberts, but they did find the DNA of three other men, Terry's husband, Googie Harris, his nephew, and another man. The rope used to strangle Terry was also tested, and again there was no DNA that matched Horace, but it did match her husband. It was determined that Googie Harris murdered his wife when he discovered she was seeing a co-worker, and then he framed his wife's lover for her murder. In 2013, a petition was sent to have a new trial and to include the new DNA evidence, but the petition was denied. More DNA testing of crime scene evidence went forward to further support Horace's innocence. 
He was also offered a plea bargain, which would have allowed him to be released from prison with time served if he admitted guilt, but he refused, determined to clear his name and have the conviction vacated. In 2018, even more DNA evidence was put forward. This time, there were fingernail clippings from Terry's body that matched her husband's nephew. A blood stain on her pants was also tested and did not match Horace. With all the evidence together, Horace Hastings' petition to vacate his sentence was granted. His release proceedings were initially sealed from the public, and he was released on October 3, 2018, with a certificate of innocence after serving nearly two decades behind bars. Googie Harris, his son Googie Harris Jr., and Joaquin Leal were charged with Terry Cheek's murder in 2019. All three pleaded guilty and were sentenced in 2022. In 2019, Robert sued Riverside County and the Sheriff's Department for mishandling evidence and was awarded $11 million in damages. Robert's now 63 has been reunited with his family, which include his two daughters, now in their 40s, and are catching up on missed time with them. It is a reunion 20 years in the making. The last time Horace Roberts held his son, Brandon was eight years old. He's now 28. As father and son walk through this airport in South Carolina, they're heading for another monumental moment as Horace falls into the arms of his wife, Deborah, seeing her too for the first time in 20 years. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Deborah is my right hand and my left hand. She stuck by me from the beginning to the end. Horace was convicted in 1999 for a murder he did not commit. DNA evidence led police to new suspects and new evidence that prove he's an innocent man. All charges against him have been dismissed and he's been declared factually innocent. Yeah, come on. As he picks up his three-year-old grandson, he's never seen until this moment. Okay. He heads for his oldest daughter, Fanchette, who's now 40 years old. She was 20 when her dad was taken away from her. Yeah, this is the good one. Yeah, Next, he spots his youngest daughter, Candace. Hey, here come my baby right here. <laughs> She's Brandon's twin sister. She, too, was eight years old the last time she saw her dad. <laughs> Nice at all. I try hard to instill uh, good values to them, how to be honest and productive in life. Horace Roberts might have been released on parole 10 years ago if he'd said he was guilty, that he was sorry and apologized for crimes he did not commit, but instead he proclaimed his innocence year after year, decade after decade. Because I didn't do it. And I refuse to allow the system to rob me of what I had left. You took my pride, you took my dignity, you stole my self-worth. I was not gonna give you my soul. And now he is a free man with simple dreams to hold on to his family and never let go. I'm glad to be home and I'm never leaving them again. Thank God. Free at last. Free at last. Number four, Anthony Powell. On March 20th, 1991, an 18-year-old was abducted in Roxbury, Massachusetts. The teen was waiting for the bus home and it had been around midnight when an unknown man approached the girl. The man had a knife and forced her to walk to a wooded area where he sexually assaulted her, then ran away. The girl went to the police and described her attacker as a clean-shaven African-American man. She said he was around 5'10", 200 pounds, wore his hair in a very specific style, which included having letters shaved into a scalp. That same evening, law enforcement picked up several men, which included 23-year-old Anthony Powell. But what was odd was that Anthony had a full head of hair, no shaved areas or letters, and also had a mustache. He was included in a photo lineup and given to the victim, who selected his photos as most closely resembling her attacker. He maintained his innocence throughout the entire ordeal. From there, Anthony was charged and went to trial a year later. 
During his trial, though DNA evidence existed and was available, it was not tested for Anthony's defense. At the time, Massachusetts was the only one of two states that didn't require DNA evidence to be preserved from criminal investigations. They also didn't have any laws requiring DNA testing to be undertaken for those accused to aid in their defense. In Anthony's case, a judge decided DNA testing would be unnecessary for the trial, and because of that, the evidence was never compared to Anthony. On September 14, 1992, a jury found Anthony Powell guilty, and he was sentenced to 12 to 20 years in prison. Anthony's family needed to make an impossible choice. They could only afford to either hire a lawyer to help Anthony file an appeal, or have the DNA evidence tested privately. They thought the appeal lawyer was the most immediate need, but they were unsuccessful in their appeals. After Anthony's incarceration, there were multiple attacks that bore a striking resemblance to the crime Anthony had been in prison for, which had occurred after he had been arrested. In 95, the cases were grouped together under the name John Doe. There had been a suspect arrested in at least one of the cases, but the victim declined to prosecute and he was released. In 2002, Anthony Powell was finally allowed to have the DNA evidence tested. After his conviction, the evidence in his case had been scheduled to be disposed of, but miraculously, someone had forgotten to do that, and it was found in an evidence locker a decade later. The evidence was tested, and the DNA collected from the rape kit did not match Anthony Powell. On March 4, 2004, almost 12 years to the day that Anthony had been arrested, simply for being at the wrong place at the wrong time, he was released when his conviction was vacated. Years later, it was determined that the man who had actually committed this attack and a series of other serial assaults was Jerry Dixon. He had a long criminal history of assault, armed robbery, and multiple motor vehicle offenses, and during an arrest in 2007, he had been required to submit DNA because he was deemed to be a violent offender. Once submitted to CODIS, his DNA matched a string of serial sexual assaults in the 90s. Many were perpetrated after Powell was arrested for a crime he committed. He was arrested and pleaded guilty to three sexual assaults on July 28, 2011. He was sentenced to 30 years in prison. Anthony Powell filed a civil rights lawsuit with the city of Boston and the state. Both cases settled, and he was awarded just over $4 million in damages for the 12 years he spent in prison. In a statement to the media, he said, quote, If you think an innocent person cannot be convicted of a crime in Massachusetts, you're fooling yourself. It happened to me. There are innocent people in prison right now. Powell's release defied the odds. He had received assistance from the New England Innocence Project, and in this case, the evidence was still available for testing. Since Powell's release, nine other men in the state have been released after DNA evidence was recovered and tested after years. Number 5. Lydell Grant It was close to midnight on December 10th, 2010 in Houston, Texas, when Aaron Shearhorn was attacked just outside of a nightclub. 28-year-old had approached a group of people, opened up his shirt, and revealed he'd been stabbed and needed help. While trying to get help, the attacker approached the man in the group of people, and Aaron ran into a nearby parking lot where the attacker followed and stabbed him several times, with several witnesses watching. Then Aaron collapsed, and the attacker calmly walked away. Aaron Shearhorn was rushed to the hospital, but later died to the extensive injuries he sustained in the attack. According to witness statements, the attack happened so fast and only a couple had seen the attack in full. Most of the others had only seen bits and pieces. Despite the numerous witnesses, no one could remember anything that stood out about the attacker. They described him as average height, average build with short hair, not exactly the most information to go on. The next night, one of the witnesses called Crime Stoppers because they saw a man who looked like the attacker. The man had gotten out of a vehicle and walked away. The witness approached the vehicle, which was empty, and he wrote down the license plate, which was passed on to law enforcement. The vehicle was registered to 33-year-old Houston resident 
Lydell Grant. They pulled up a photo of Lydell and showed it to the witnesses. Some of them believed the image was that of the attacker. The remaining weren't sure or didn't believe the attacker looked like Lydell. Lydell had a criminal history of petty theft, stealing credit cards, fraud, and possession of cannabis, and he'd been in prison before, but he had attributed that to hanging out with the wrong crowd in his youth. On December 15th, Lydell was stopped for a traffic violation, and when Houston police pulled up his information, they discovered a warrant for his arrest. When the officer told him he was wanted for murder and there had been witnesses that identified him, he said, quote, I don't care if you have six million witnesses. I didn't kill him. His vehicle was searched and there was a Halloween mask, a wig, and a knife. He was arrested and charged with first-degree murder. None of the items ever had any connection to Aaron's murder. Lydell maintained his innocence all throughout the pretrial hearings. He was held in custody while he awaited trial. DNA from Aaron's body was tested before the trial began, and under his fingernails was found two sources of DNA. Neither was found to have come from Lydell Grant, but the test was deemed inconclusive for trial. Additionally, the witnesses who didn't believe Lydell was the man they saw attack Aaron were barred from testifying. Lydell had an alibi for the time when Aaron was murdered, and that witness also testified for the jury. Despite having no physical evidence tying him to the crime, having an alibi that was able to be corroborated, it wasn't enough. On December 6, 2012, a jury convicted Lydell Grant of first-degree murder. He was sentenced to life in prison. He filed for an appeal in 2014, but his conviction was upheld. In 2015, his lawyer asked to have the evidence tested for DNA, which was declined. In 2018, his case caught the attention of the Innocence Project of Texas, who selected the case as a case study for the Texas A&M School of Law. They began to go through the case, starting from the ground up. The law students reviewed the data from the DNA analysis and soon noticed that the data clearly excluded Lydell's DNA from the sample, which should have been clear to the forensic examiner who reviewed the data for trial. The data files were sent to Cybergenetics Corp. in Pittsburgh, where they asked to have an expert review the data. The Cybergenetics reviewed and gave a similar answer. Lydell's DNA was not found under Aaron Shearhorn's fingernails. Lawyers petitioned to have the unknown individual's DNA submitted to CODIS, which was approved in 2019. The DNA hit a convicted felon, 41-year-old Jamerico Carter. Carter lived in Houston at the time and had been convicted in 2018 for a murder that had striking similarity to Aaron Shearhorn's murder. Lydell's legal team petitioned all the evidence in this case to be retested, including the items found in his vehicle, confirming again that Lydell's DNA was not found on Aaron's body and that there was no DNA found on the knife that had been found in his car. While they were going through all the evidence in this case, they also discovered a recorded police interview where Jamarico Carter confessed to killing Aaron Shearhorn. Lydell's legal team also brought in a psychologist who reviewed the trial transcripts and the witness testimonies and testified that, in her opinion, the witness testimonies should be looked at with more scrutiny, testifying that there were multiple reasons why witnesses to crimes have a hard time identifying the attacker. In this case, they were likely more focused on the knife than the attacker's face. She also stated that the witnesses weren't separated when they identified Grant from the lineup, and the witnesses being together inflated their confidence in the identification. One of the witnesses years later said that officers pressured him to select Lydell as the attacker. On May 19, 2021, all the new evidence was put forward to the Court of Criminal Appeals, and they motioned to vacate the conviction. Lydell Grant was found to be innocent of the crime he had been convicted of. Lydell had spent nearly a decade in prison and would have served more for a crime he had never committed. He was able to have his record expunged and was also awarded almost $675,000 from the state as compensation for his time incarcerated. I feel, uh, I feel free now. It was a long time coming. I always claim my innocence. I just thank God to the Innocent Project. They, they really, I mean, they believed in me. They took my case and they worked it. 
I think I think the supporters, my family, y'all can see I got a beautiful family. Uh, man, it's, it's it's wonderful. God is good. Always know that God is good, man. God is wonderful because yes, yes, He was there yes. for me when I ain't have nobody. God was there for me. Well, that is it for this video. As always, thank you so much for watching. If you like this content and what I do over here, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you don't miss my next upload. As always, if you give this video a like if you enjoyed the content, as that is the easiest way to help the channel grow, that would be much appreciated. We also have channel membership or Patreon if you want to get more behind the scenes content as well as exclusive content or just to support the channel. In the description box of this video, you also find links to all my socials to connect with me as well as other goodies. But that is it for me. Thank you so much for being here. I will see you all in the next one. Bye for now.